That was something. I'm going to have to use that back at my university. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending your Friday night with me. I am privileged to work in what I think is one of the most exciting scientific fields um, happening right now. Right now, we have technology to look inside the human genome. We have tools to start to answer some questions that humans have been asking for millennia. At the same time, I work in a field that is perhaps one of the most contested and controversial areas of science. If we try to crack the mysteries of the human genome, what kind of future are we ushering in? So in addition to the science, I also want to talk about the stories we tell about the science. What kind of stories do we tell about DNA? What stories are a time to put them to bed? What stories can we embrace moving forward? So to get us started on that, we've already listened to a little music. We're going to listen to a little more. Um, I have a clip for you from a music video by the American rap artist Kendrick Lamar. Um, this is a video that he put out for a track of his from a couple years ago. It will be very quickly clear to you why I picked this particular track. I want you, in addition to watching this lovely performance by John Cheadle, to listen to the lyrics and ask yourself, what are some of the claims that Lamar is making about himself his behavior, his identity, and what role is DNA playing in the stories he's telling about himself. So let's watch that video now. All right. So in case you didn't catch that because the English was too fast, here's some lyrics from that. I've got loyalty, I've got royalty inside my DNA. Cocaine quarter piece got war and peace inside my DNA. I got power, poison, pain, and joy inside my DNA. I got hustle, though, ambition flow inside my DNA. So there's a whole collection of claims here about himself and his behavior. And these are claims that people have been wondering about, like I said, for millennia. Can we connect things that we might think of as character traits, like loyalty? Can we connect social position, like royalty? Can we connect criminalized or norm-violating behavior, like cocaine use? What about hustle, ambition? Can we think of these things as inside our DNA, connected to our DNA? How would we even go about answering that question? Until very recently, if you were interested in this question scientifically, can we connect differences between people in psychological characteristics such as hustle or ambition or loyalty to their genetics. We really only had one tool, and that was the study of different types of family members. So you could do a study where you looked at children who were given up at birth for adoption and raised by parents they weren't genetically related to. And then you could go back and see, do those children resemble their biological parents whom they've maybe never met? or have never been raised by. Even more commonly, you might use a tool that my lab still uses, which is the twin study. So there's two types of twins. One is identical twins. You have one, er one egg, one sperm, one fetus, oops, and cell division, and you end up with two people. So they're the closest thing to clones that we have walking the planet today. There's also fraternal twins, two eggs, two sperm, they have the same genetic relationship as brothers or sisters. They just happen to share the same pregnancy. So fraternal twins are more genetically different from each other than identical twins. So psychologists have long been interested in this question of, do those genetic differences translate into greater differences between them in some aspect of their psychology? So this is a slide from um, some of my colleagues who do reading research. And what you have here is the relationship between twin one and twin two for their reading ability when they're identical twins versus fraternal twins. People have done this type of study on literally millions of twins. 
And the overwhelming consensus of all of that research is that identical twins are more similar for nearly every aspect of their psychology and their behavior. My colleague Tinko Polderman um, published in 2015 this study that summarized 50 years of twin research in nearly 15 million pairs of twins. This is a figure from my book, The Genetic Lottery, where I've pulled some of the data from her study. So what we have here is the triangles represent identical twins, who again are as close to genetic clones as we have walking the planet, for humans at least. The circles represent fraternal twins. Um, so they are people who, again, have the same genetic relationship as ordinary siblings. The size of the dot represents how many twin pairs is this estimate. And what I'm plotting here is the similarity of twins for seven domains of their life. Their personality, so things like how extroverted are you, how shy are you, how warm and agreeable versus cold or aloof, how organized, dutiful, plan, planful are you. Cognitive abilities, and by this I mean performance on tests of things like how quickly can you remember something, can you manipulate information in your head. Education, which is simply how far you go in school. Employment, are you in the labor market? Social hazards to health. So this is things like do you exercise, do you smoke, do you drink? Mental disorders, so this would be psychopathology like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, and then finally interpersonal relationships. Do you describe yourself as satisfied with the relationships in your life? Are you married? Are you divorced? Do you describe yourself as having friends? Do you describe yourself as being lonely? And what I want you to notice is that for every single domain of human life that we're plotting here, fraternal twins who are more genetically different are more different in their life outcomes, which suggests, it doesn't prove, but it suggests that genes are a difference maker. If we'd ended up with different genes, maybe our life outcomes would be different. But I said it suggests that, because nothing about twin studies is actually measuring anything about your DNA. And twin studies require a lot of assumptions about, well, maybe fraternal twins are just treated more differently by their parents or by, by their schools. So these results, even though they're based on 50 years of research with 15 million pairs of twins, remain remarkably controversial. Is this telling us really something about what's going on in your DNA? In recent years, though, we've been able to go beyond twin studies to actually measure the human genome. So each one of you and each one of your cells are 23 pairs of chromosomes, unless you have a trisomy like Downs, in which case you might have an extra copy of one of your chromosomes, 22 autosomes pairs, and then one pair of sex chromosomes, XX or XY. All of that genetic material is made up of four DNA letters, abbreviated G, C, T, and A. So what scientists can now do is measure what is your genetic code. The Human Genome Project, which took place in the 90s, was completed in the early 2000s, took over a decade to complete, and took tens of millions of dollars. Today, kids come into my lab, they spit into a tube, I send giant boxes of saliva actually to a lab in Scotland, and for about $55 American dollars per child, I get a readout of their genome. Now, I'm not sequencing every little bit of their DNA. I'm measuring what are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. A SNP is a single DNA letter difference that differs between people. So along my genetic code, I might have a T, where you have a G, and that would be a variant, something that differs between us. It's a SNP. So considered against the backdrop of the human genome, that's actually just a tiniest fraction of our DNA. All humans, regardless of race, are over 99% genetically similar. And the differences between us don't fit into our neat little boxes of racial categories. So for instance, two people who both come from different places in Africa 
might be more genetically different from each other than someone who comes from London and someone who comes from Shanghai. Our boxes for race don't capture the genetic diversity that we see, and the genetic diversity is just a tiny fraction of our genome. So we have this incredible sameness, this incredible commonality across all humans, but there's still that less than 1% difference between us. And that's the part that, as a psychologist, I'm really interested in. I'm interested in people, but I'm particularly interested in differences between people. How, do that, how does that tiny fraction of DNA that differs between us shape the way that our lives turn out differently? How has your life turned out differently than your siblings, from your neighbors, from where you thought it was going to go when you were a child? Can measuring the genome help us answer those questions? So now that it, we can measure the genome cheaply, non-invasively, meaning we can't, don't have to have blood, we can have spit, and at scale, well, there's always a way to make money off of that. So I can't really see you, but I would love in the Q&A for you to tell me if you've ever done one of these companies, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, where you pay money to send your spit into a multinational corporation that will give you some information about your perhaps genetic risk for a health condition or where your recent ancestors came from. So this is a graph, and it's actually old. It's from four years ago, showing the millions of people who have paid to be genotyped from one of these companies. And if we followed this graph into 2022, you would see that it's risen even further. So not only do we have the technology, but we now have genetic samples for millions upon millions of people across the globe, but in particular from Northern Europe. So people from Northern Europe, or people whose ancestors came from Northern Europe, represent about 17% of the globe's population, but over 95% of the people who've participated in genetic research or genetic study. So consumer genomics, this paper claims, will change your life, regardless of whether or not you get tested. So you might be sitting there thinking, I would never give my DNA to 23andMe, but it might not matter because, well, one, one of your relatives might have given their, their DNA to that company. And two, because the discoveries that are made possible by this wealth of genetic information might influence your life in the future. One of the ways this might happen is because the wealth of this genetic data makes possible a type of study known as the Genome-Wide Association Study, or GWAS. So in a GWAS, we start with a very large sample of people. I'm going to tell you in a little bit about a study that my colleagues and I did where we're pooling data from one and a half million people. We're looking for people who are similar with regards to their genetic background. So their ancestors recently came from a relatively constrained, narrow part of the world, and that's most commonly Northern Europe. So the most common GWAS is conducted in people who say they're white British, who participated in the UK Biobank, and when we look at their genome, we see patterns of genetic ancestry suggesting that all of their recent genetic ancestors came from that one spot in the world. We then measure their DNA, most commonly these SNPs, these variants that differ between people. And then we basically do a giant, if you're going to be polite about it, data mining exercise, if you're trying to be derogatory, a giant fishing expedition, where we try to identify which genetic variants are correlated with some outcome that we've measured in people. That outcome, that observable characteristic, is called a phenotype. That phenotype could be, how tall are you? Can we find genetic variants that are associated with being a little bit taller or a little bit shorter? That, that phenotype could be, how heavy are you? That phenotype could be, how many symptoms of ADHD do you have? That phenotype could be, have you ever developed liver cancer? But I'm a psychologist, so the phenotypes I'm interested in are things like, how far have you gone in school? At what age did you lose your virginity? How many sexual partners have you had? Have you ever gotten addicted to drugs? 
And just like the biomedical phenotypes, or just like height or body size, we can go looking for genetic variants that are correlated with differences in outcomes between people. Now, you'll notice that I've used the word correlation. I'm finding genetic variants that are correlated with these outcomes. Those genetic correlations could be kind of three general types of genetic correlations. So the first thing we could be pick up, pick, pick, picking up on are genes that actually make a difference for your biology, that ultimately make a difference for your behavior. So for example, there's a genetic variant that changes how your liver metabolizes alcohol. It doesn't work as well, so you get this toxic byproduct of alcohol that builds up in your system, and then you're more likely to flush, get really, really red if you drink, especially if you drink too fast. So people who have this genetic variant are less likely to become addicted to alcohol because it's more difficult for them to drink a lot in one sitting, it's less pleasant for them, it's potentially socially embarrassing if they have a red face in the situation. Some of you might have this genetic variant, you might have this flushing reaction. So that's a gene that's causing something about our biology, and our biology is changing our behavior in some way. But these correlations might also be picking up on genes that work more like the correlation between a gene that affects your nicotine receptors in your brain, which is correlated with lung cancer. So that's a genetic variant that's working through the environment. I have, a, I have access to cigarettes. When I take a puff of a cigarette, that nicotine is more rewarding to my brain. The more I smoke, the higher risk I am of lung cancer. We sometimes call this an environmentally mediated genetic effect because the genes are, are influencing our behavior, but it's operating through some exposure. Genetics to smoking more to lung cancer. The third type of genetic pattern this might be picking up on is what some people have called chopsticks genes. So if I put into a study people who were white British from London and ethnically Han Chinese from Shanghai, and I put them all into a GWAS, and I did a GWAS of, do you use chopsticks or a fork? I would definitely find genes that are correlated with chopsticks usage. But not because the gene has anything to do with motor dexterity. It's because populations that have been separated for many generations differ genetically, but they also differ culturally. So with the GWAS, we never can be fully sure whether we're picking up on a correlation that's really reflecting the gene is causing something in my biology. The gene is causing something to be different in my exposure, in my environment. Or the gene just happens to be correlated with this thing because people who differ genetically also differ geographically and culturally. And that's one of the biggest scientific problems we have right now. Getting around it requires thinking about within family studies, and we'll come back to that in a second. So I've been, done a big GWAS. I found genes that are correlated with some phenotype of interest. And what never happens is you never find this is the gene for depression or this is the gene for autism. There is no single gene for schizophrenia. There's no one gene that affects your likelihood of being addicted to drugs or going farther in school. All psychological and behavioral characteristics that differ between people are polygenic, meaning that they're influenced by hundreds or even thousands of genetic variants, each of which tilt the playing field just a little bit, change the probability of developing a phenotype a tiniest bit. So we have these results where we have potentially thousands of genes, each of which have a tiny correlation with what we're interested in studying. What do we do with that information? Well, one thing that's actually kind of simple sounding, but turns out to be surprisingly effective, is to take that information and apply it to a new group of people by basically just adding information up. So if I've done a big GWAS, I could take people in this room who were ancestrally similar to the people in my original GWAS, and I could measure your genomes. I could say, okay, for this genetic variant, you've gotten two copies, one from each parent, one copy just from your mom or your dad, or zero copies. 
I can multiply that times the correlations that I've estimated in my previous study, and I can add all that information up into a single number. And that number is a polygenic score. So it's my best guess based on just your DNA, and that best guess is still pretty uncertain of your likelihood of showing a phenotype from the genetics that I've measured. Okay, so that was a lot of information. There's some math, some you know, Greek notation on there. So we're going to take a, not take a break, but we're going to resummarize that in the form of a cartoon. So I, co I collaborated with my colleagues from the Jacobs Foundation of Jacobs Coffee and Chocolate to try to explain this um, in cartoon form. So if that cocktail went to your head and you missed this, this is a recap of the GWAS to polygenic score procedure. Scientists study the connection between genes and education by collecting genetic data from hundreds of thousands of people. They look at tiny bits of DNA to see what people who have done well in school have in common. Information about these bits of DNA can then be used to create what scientists refer to as a polygenic score, a single number that adds up the impact of many variables in our genes. It's important to note that no one knows for sure how these bits of DNA work together to make it more likely that one child will do well in school while another will struggle. Unlike conditions that are linked to a single gene, such as certain genetic disorders, educational attainment and the ease or difficulty with which one learns are associated with thousands of different genes. So far, the methods commonly used have been tested only in studies focusing on people whose ancestors came from the same part of the world, in most cases, Europe. Okay, so they did it in much fewer words, what took me several slides to get through. So now you should have a pretty good understanding of how we get to a polygenic score. And people have used this method to study all sorts of things. And the use of polygenic score when we're talking about biomedical phenotypes actually isn't that controversial. So this is um, two papers by a group where they're looking at a polygenic score predicting the onset of severe obesity with age or your likelihood of developing coronary artery disease. And I think the idea that your genes have something to do with your risk of coronary artery disease is something that most people you know, probably don't think of as that surprising. Where things get complicated, though, is when we use that same method and apply it to the sort of socially valued life course outcomes that psychologists study. So this is data from my colleagues at the Social Science Genetics Association Consortium. It is hot off the presses. This paper was published five days ago, where they did a GWAS of educational attainment, how far you go in school, in three million people, identified genetic variants associated with more years of education, and then used them to construct a polygenic score in two data sets. So the blue bars here are white Americans who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and the green bar here are white Americans who are in their late 30s to early 40s. So what we have along the horizontal axis is what is your decile of that polygenic score? Are you in the lowest 10%, the highest 10%, somewhere in between? And what we've plotted the bars is what is your likelihood of graduating from college? And what I want you to see here is that people who are in the lowest decile of the polygenic score have about a 7% chance of graduating college compared to over 70%, 10 times greater, in the highest decile of polygenic score. I think this result is amazing. We get our DNA sequence at conception. I believe the video said that if you have questions about that happens, you can ask the science and cocktail organizers after the event. Um, and we graduate from college, if we do, generally when we're, what, 22? So decades later. And yet researchers can forecast which people have a 10 time greater probability of graduating from college based just on information from their DNA. My group and I did a similar study where we're looking not at education, but what clinical psychologists call externalizing. So internalizing is I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm introverted, I'm inhibited. 
externalizing is the tendency to not follow the rules. And, and sometimes not, not following the rules is a good thing, but not following the rules tends to get you in trouble. So in this case, we were pooling data from one and a half million people, and we asked them about seven things. What was your ADHD symptoms in childhood? At what age did you lose your virginity? How many people have you ever had sex with? Have you ever used cannabis? Are you addicted to alcohol? Um, have you, um, what is your answer to the uh, question, I'm the sort of person who likes to take risks? And are you a smoker? So seven things that are different, not everyone who does one of those things does other things, but seven things that are correlated and seven things that represent a tendency to do behaviors that are punished and against the rules. We then looked for SNPs that are correlated with all seven of these phenotypes to use, construct this polygenic score. And what did we find? We found that we could construct a polygenic score that predicted some things that were related to what we originally studied. So have you ever had a moderate alcohol use disorder? But that also predicted, have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Do you have three or more symptoms of antisocial personality disorder, which is a, a clinical diagnosis related to psychopathy? So just like education, we can use this GWAS technique to construct genetic indicators that are related to things we really care about, like whether or not you've ever been convicted of a felony. These are American samples, by the way, which is why the, we have the largest proportion of um, the largest proportion of incarcerated people in the entire world, which is why the numbers for criminal justice contacts, such as arrest and incarceration, are a good deal higher than you would see here in Denmark. Okay. So this has led to a question, which is, are these genetic fortune tellers? If we can link something that you get at conception with outcomes like, have you ever been arrested by the age of 40? Are our genes telling us something about our fate or our destiny? Um, the media is not really helpful in combating this perception. So, for instance, this was an article in MIT Tech Review where they talked about polygenic scores, and what did they call them? Forecasts of genetic fate. I think this is a really harmful framing, actually, because it underestimates how much variability there is in people's outcomes, even when they have a certain level of this polygenic score. When we talk about genetic fate, we are um, pulling on this idea that's often called genetic determinism. So this is a line from Shakespeare's The Tempest. This is where we get the phrase, the nature-nurture debate, where a character is calling another character a devil, a born devil, on whose nature nurture can never stick, on whom my pains humanely taken, all, all lost, quite lost. It's easy to interpret polygenic scores as potentially being evidence for this type of genetic determinism. If we can predict your likelihood of being arrested or graduating from college based on your DNA, is that a, is a, a sign that perhaps some people are born devils? on which nurture will never stick. This is the same data that I showed you previously with the educational attainment GWAS, except now instead of putting it into a bar graph where I'm showing you the probability of graduating from college, I'm now showing you a plot that shows each individual person. Each person is a dot. So what I want you to do is pick a spot along the horizontal axis, let's say pick one standard deviation below the mean polygenic score, and then run your eye up and down the graph to look at the range of life outcomes for people who have the same genetics. What we'll see here is that people who have the same polygenic score, some of them didn't get past the eighth grade, some of them somewhat masochistically, like I did, stayed in school for 22 years. There's a whole range of educational outcomes. When we think of averages, which is what we often do as scientists, we can lose sight of the incredible variability and in individuality of humans. 
any one person's life outcome. It's actually very difficult to predict from their genetics. So knowing someone's genes is kind of like knowing that they grew up in a rich or poor family. It gives you a sense of their average probability of events. But just as we know rich kids who struggled in school and poor kids who really excelled, um, a polygenic score similarly is just giving us some information about averages, but it's not predicting an individual human life. We can also look to situations where we have changed the relationship between genetics and outcomes. It's not true that nature is something onto which nurture can never stick. We know from science that nurture can change people's lives. Many of you in the audience here are wearing eyeglasses, and that's the classic example. If you have poor eyesight, it's probably because of your genes. You inherited it from one or more of your parents. And we ameliorate that not by crispering your genome, not by selecting your embryos, but by giving you an environmental intervention that you wear on your face. So even genetically caused phenotypes can be intervened upon using the environment. To, to give you a, an example that's closer to behavior or psychology, we can think about therapy. So for teenagers who have a vulnerability to alcohol addiction problems, one of the most effective forms of treatment is not treating the adolescent, but treating the whole family system. Creating the sort of relationship between parents and children such that children want to confide in their parents about who they're hanging out with and what they're doing with their time. Parents being enough of a presence in their, their children's lives so that they know when their children is home, know when their child is not home. So this type of family therapy works on average to decrease the risk of alcohol use problems in teenagers. But it works in particular on kids who have a genetic risk for alcoholism. So again, we have this genetic risk for alcoholism, but we're not treating it by changing something about the child's biology, but by encouraging their family to work together more cohesively, more openly, improving their family relationships. It's a nurture that changes the effect of nature. We can also see this on a really broad scale. So if we look at women who were born in the early part of the 20th century, their genetic scores are almost unrelated to how far they went in school. For my grandmother who grew up poor in rural Mississippi, whether or not she had some sort of genetic talent or skill that might have made school easier was utterly irrelevant. There was no way that her family could afford college. It wasn't even an idea. Whereas for me, I grew up more affluent later in the 20th century. I had infinitely leagues more educational opportunity than she did. And so what we see is that relationship between the polygenic score and education has actually gotten stronger for women as we move through the 20th century. Um, we see the, a similar pattern if we look in Estonia. So after the collapse of the Soviet regime there, you see an increase in the amount of genetic variation in educational outcomes. So it's not true that genes are destiny. Polygenic scores don't work like pregnancy tests. They can't tell you something with 99% accuracy. They are estimates of something that make a difference on average, but humans end up being remarkably variable in their life course outcomes. And those genetics are always working hand in hand with nurture, with the environment, with social and economic policy, with therapy, with opportunity in order to shape how people's lives go. Okay, so genetic determinism is a story we tell that isn't true, but oftentimes when people think, well, yes, you went to therapy, or yes, you had more opportunity, but is that really changing who you truly are? Is it really affecting your true self? And this is a story we tell about genes as making up our identity, as being essential to our uniqueness. Again, this is not an accident, this is an idea that's deliberately propagated. If you ever do 23andMe, you'll get a kit that says, welcome to you. Welcome to you, isn't that a fascinating tagline? You have been on this earth for decades. 
you have been developing an adult identity and self. And a direct-to-consumer genetics testing company is saying, no, 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 no. Welcome to who you really are, which is what the information we're going to give about you based on your DNA. So this is a form of what psychologists call essentialism. Essentialism, we can be essentialists about categories, we can be essentialists about things, but we're particularly essentialists when we think about other people. So essentialism is this idea that there is some thing, some it, some it factor, and without it, that person, that category, that thing, would not be itself. If we were talking 200 years ago in Europe, where more people subscribe to a formal religion, then that essence would be often thought of as a soul or a spirit. Now, in a more secular age, many of us have given up the idea of a soul or a spirit, but we still have that essentialist thinking, and our essence placeholder has become DNA. DNA is what many people think makes who your true self is. But is there any evidence that that's true? Again, I think this is where science can disrupt some of our old stories. This is one of my favorite papers that's honestly ever been published. It was published in Science in 2013. And I think part of the reason I love it so much is that I study humans, free-range humans over which I have no control. And these people study rats over which you have exquisite control. You can do exactly what you want experimentally. So in this case, they, um, and not rats, excuse me, mice, but you also have control over mice too. The rat people would be very offended that I, that I mixed up rats and mice. Um, so what they did is they have inbred mice who are genetically nearly identical, and they raised them in exactly similar circumstances. So they could have control over the light, and the water, and the food, and the handling, and the everything. So it, it's like if a mad scientist had, you know, 40 identical twins and kept them in their exactly equal rearing environment chambers. Obviously, we can never do this with humans, but they did this with mice. And then once the mice reached adulthood, they put them all together in a big vivarium where they could interact, and they saw what happened. And what you see over the period of time amongst these genetically identical mice who had identical rearing experiences is the emergence of individuality. Some mice became dominant, some mice became subordinate, some mice became very active and exploratory, some mice were kind of couch potatoes that liked to stay in the dark tunnels of the vivarium all day. And what's more is those differences in behavior became increasingly stable over time and were correlated with emerging differences in brain. Life created personality, even amongst animals who were genetically identical and had identical rearing experiences in childhood. We don't have mice, but we do have twins. And we have occasionally times where things get really mixed up with twins. These are um, two sets of identical twins who are from um, uh, Bogota. And they were the subject of a really fascinating story by the journalist Sue Dominus in the New York Times Magazine, because they were mixed up at birth. So there are two sets of identical twins, Two were swapped accidentally, and everyone went home thinking that they were a part of a pair of fraternal twins. So mom knew she was pregnant with twins, she got twins, she went home, she has fraternal twins, and then in adulthood, oops, they find out that they have a long-lost identical twin brother. What makes this story extra fascinating is that one set of um, boys was raised in rural poverty, and the other was raised in a relatively affluent professional family. And this caused, I think not surprisingly, almost an existential crisis in these young men, because they saw someone who was them, but not them. 
saw someone who was genetically identical to them, but had been raised in entirely different environmental circumstances, and who was a different person. And they started to question, what is actually essential to me? Who would I have been if my life had gone differently? One of the boys had always been um, very contemptuous of anyone who was involved in gang violence and guerrilla violence. And then his identical twin brother had been part of the guerrillas. And he said, well, maybe if I had grown up there, I would have joined. They were brutal, but they were popular. Far from believing in the inevitability of his professional success, he started to worry about his character in that altered life would it have withstood the forces around him? So whether or not we're looking at genetically identical mice or genetically identical people, we see that the genome is not enough to encode an entire identity. There's this emergence of individuality that's shaped by circumstance. I'm a psychologist, I teach intro psych at the University of Texas, and I teach with a personality psychologist. And I've been really influenced by how personality psychologists think about identity. So this is the work of Dan McAdams, who talks about the three levels of knowing yourself. So the first level of knowing yourself is just knowing your traits. How do you compare to people, other people in sort of broad behavioral dimensions? I am extroverted, but neurotic. I'm smart, but better with words than math. I am warm-ish, right? These are traits about myself. And if you, you know, just knew the results of a personality test and an IQ test, like, you would know something about me. But would you know me? Well, you wouldn't know the second layer of personality, which is personal concerns. What do I want in life? What do I want in the next six months? How do I generally go about getting those things? What are my goals and ambitions? Even if you knew that, though, that I want to write another book, I'm about to have another baby, you know, I'm usually, unfortunately, like sometimes passive aggressive when I, you know, trying to get what I want. Would you really know me, my deepest level of identity? Because that deepest level of identity is the story we tell about ourselves that connects our past, our present, our future, and that story is always evolving. So our genes make a difference for our traits, but they can never encode our personal concerns, and they certainly won't tell us about the narrative self that we've constructed over our decades of life. Okay, so genes are not destiny. Genes are not identity. I did write a book about genes, what do I think they are? I think they're a form of luck. I was having lunch today with some scientist colleagues who were here in Copenhagen, and they told me that the English word luck doesn't translate necessarily super well in Danish. What I mean here is something like chance. I mean an event that could have maybe not happened, but did, that was outside of your control, that's significant for your life in some way, and that is morally arbitrary, meaning that I don't think of you as a good or bad person in the moral sense of this happened to you. It's not morally blameworthy or praiseworthy. So if I won the lottery, that would be lucky, but being lucky doesn't make me good. So why do I think of genes as a form of luck? So you each have two copies of all your genes, one from your mom, one from your dad. And if you're a parent, your kid, each of your kids, got one of those two copies, and which one they got was random. So if we take any pair of parents, there are 70 trillion potential possible combinations of their genes that could be given to their kid. I think about this all the time. I, as you can probably tell, I'm pregnant right now. I'm about six months along, and I think you're one in 70 trillion of all the possible combinations my husband and I could have conceived. It's that one luck of the draw. But that luck of the draw doesn't necessarily fit neatly into a category of good luck or bad luck. 
A really good example of this is the gene that codes for, um, or that gives you sickle cell disease. So if you have one copy of this genetic variant, remember you could have gotten two, but if you just got one, you're resistant to malaria. If you have two copies, you have sickle cell disease, which can sometimes be fatal. Is that genetic variant good luck or bad luck? It depends. Do you live in a malaria-prone area of the world? What else? Did you get another copy? Do you live in a part of the world in which there's good treatments for sickle cell disease? Genes are like a classic Zen cone of a farmer whose horse runs away. And the other villagers say, oh, such bad luck. And he says, we'll see. And then the horse comes back and he brings 10 other horses with him. And the villagers say, what good luck. And the farmer says, we'll see. And then when trying to train one of the horses, the farmer's son breaks his leg. And the villagers say, what bad luck. And the farmer says, we'll see. And then the army comes through and recruits all the able-bodied men off to war, but the son with the broken leg can't go to war, and so he gets to stay home and help his father. And the villagers say, what good luck. And the farmer says, we'll see. Genetic variants are just that, they're variants. Many mutations are deleterious, but without mutations, we would have no evolution. Are they good luck or bad luck? They're chance, they're contingency, and their effects depend on everything else that's happening. My colleagues and I did a study where we looked at which genetic variants are associated with going further in school and are not related to how you do on tests of cognitive ability. So these are things that don't make you necessarily better at memorizing things, they don't necessarily make you better at reading fast, but they are related to going further in school. And they turn out to be related to all sorts of interesting things. So organized people do better in school, Morning people do better in school. Children who go through puberty later do better in school, particularly girls, because early maturing girls get all sorts of negative, unwanted attention from boys, and they're less likely to be put into advanced math classes. And all these things, morningness and personality and puberty, are related to your genes. So you have a whole bunch of things that are related with going further in school um, that aren't your cognitive ability. And then we look to see what else are they correlated with. So that's that top graph with the dots. And if you look at the orange dots here, you see that there are some genetic variants that are correlated with going further in school that are also correlated with being more likely to have schizophrenia, autism, obsessive compulsive disorder, anorexia nervosa. You have a genetic variant and you're more likely to get a PhD and you're also more likely to have schizophrenia. Is that good luck or bad luck? We'll see. So why do I think luck matters for social equality? In order to think about that, I think we need to go back a little bit and just think about what are some of our deepest rooted intuitions about fairness and equality. And in order to look at that, we can look at children. So children, for instance, if they're given five erasers that they have to divide between two kids, but the two kids don't seem to be different in any morally arbitrary way, most American children would rather throw the fifth eraser away than give one child more than another child. If you have more than one ch child, I guarantee you've experienced this. He got more cuddles than me. She got a bigger slice of cookie than I did. Is it my turn to get the, sit in the front seat? Is it my turn to pick the television show? Children are very keen on everything being fair, and by fair they mean even Stephen, exactly equal between them. But it's not just children. So um, I've heard that Science and Cocktails has actually had this primatologist here, which is a testament to the quality of the speakers you get. So this is a, um, a video where we have two monkeys who are being trained to perform a task, and they're getting rewarded. And let's see what monkeys have in terms of preference for equality. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. 
The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. Right. What happens next? She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> oh, don't you feel that? You see the monkey go, and you feel it. You know a time in your life where you felt that way. That feeling of, it's not fair. I'm going to throw this cucumber back in your face. <laughs> so children and monkeys have this deeply ingrained preference for equality. And yet, we live in places that are not equal. So this is data from um, income inequality across a variety of countries. And what's plotted here is the Gini Index. So the Gini index ranges between zero and one. So a Gini index of zero would mean that everyone has the exact same income. A Gini index of one would indicate that one person has everything and everyone else has nothing. Um, so I'm from the United States, which is which one of these is not like the other? So the United States is one of the most unequal places in the world. Our Gini index is above 0.4. In Denmark, y'all are one of the most equal societies in the world in terms of income, which is really interesting. Why? What is going on such that Americans have um, essentially overcome what are really deep preferences for equality, such that we live in a place with some of the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich. We get clues from this if you ask people, one, well, is income inequality unfair? Should we do anything about it? Is this even a problem to be solved? Um, about a decade ago, then President Obama said, inequality is the problem of our time. And it turns out that many Americans disagreed with that statement. Um, Americans, and particularly Americans who identify as Republicans, Americans who identify as supporters of former President Trump, are global outliers in being unwilling to say that income inequality is unfair. So 26% of American Republicans say that income inequality is even a problem to be solved. And if you look at the reasons that they give for income inequality, you'll see that there's striking differences between Republicans and Democrats, where Republicans are much more likely to, to describe income inequality as being due to the virtues of the rich. The rich work harder. The rich delay gratification. The rich take more risks. And they're less likely to attribute income inequality to luck or to the family circumstances that people have been born into. So in America, we have a population that is opposed to even doing anything about income inequality. And they give reasons for income inequality that say, this doesn't have anything to do with luck. This has to do with working harder and delaying gratification. So there's a, um, a really excellent group of economists um, in Norway who have done a series of experiments about this. And I love the title of this paper, Cutthroat Capitalism versus Cuddly Socialism. Are Americans more meritocratic and efficiency-seeking than Scandinavians? I was hearing over lunch um, the perceived differences between Danes, Swedes, Norwegians, um, and Finns. So I apologize to the Danes in the audience that they're using just Norwegians as the stand-in for all of Scandinavia here. 
So this is two samples, one in Norway, one in the US, and in all their experiments, they have a pair of people do a task. They're working. They're working like the monkeys are working. So they do something and the experimenter pays them according to some rule. And then there's observers watching them. And then the observers have to make a decision about whether or not people are just going to walk away with their earnings as is. Some people get grapes, some people get cucumbers. Or are they going to redistribute some of the grapes at the end of the experiment? What's interesting about this is they can manipulate the extent to which the earnings seem to be due to the talent or merit or effort of the worker, or whether the earnings seem to be due, like the monkeys that we saw, just due to differences in luck. And what's interesting is that, on the whole, Norway is, or people in this Norwegian sample, prefer more equality than Americans do. So regardless of the condition, people from America are much less likely to redistribute the cucumbers and the grapes at the end of the experiment than people from Norway. But across both countries, if the role of luck in income inequality is highlighted, even Americans will support more redistribution than when the role of kind of merit or effort is highlighted. And I think this is really powerful evidence that across countries, humans are luck sensitive in their perceptions of when inequality is fair and whether things they support redistribution. Usually when we think about luck, we're thinking about external luck. Or we might be thinking about the luck of your family advantages. But there's even yet another form of luck that matters for people's lives, and that is the genes that they happen to inherit. So part of the reason that I'm really interested in talking about why genes matter for human lives is because I personally think that income inequality is a problem, and we live in one of the most, I live in one of the most unequal countries in the world. How could that political conversation be changed if this other source of luck, we also paid attention to that. This perspective of mine is very influenced by the political philosopher John Rawls, who wrote in his A Theory of Justice, once we are troubled by the influence of either social contingencies or natural chance on the determination of distributive shares, we are bound on reflection to be bothered by the influence of the other. From a moral standpoint, the two seem equally arbitrary. Across countries, in Denmark, in Norway, in the United States, policymakers and educators are interested in how is a child's life structured by the socioeconomic status or income or social advantages of their family of origin, and how can we narrow those gaps? But I'm interested in starting points writ large, not just social starting points, but genetic starting points. And from my perspective, a child's genes is just as morally arbitrary, it's just another chance event, as being born to a rich or poor parent. How would our policies be different if we took that seriously? We can contrast this perspective of genes as luck with an older story, which is genes as worth, genes as forming some sort of natural hierarchy of humans of better people and worse people. If the luck story holds promise for making people less tolerant of inequality, the worth story, I think, is the most dangerous story. Because it's the old eugenic story that there's naturally superior people that deserve more, deserve more goods, deserve more freedom, deserve more welfare. We actually don't have to look very far to find examples of this old story of genes as hierarchical, as genes of superiority, of genes as equated to worth. That, part, that story is alive and well in America today. All men are created equal. Well, that's not true. Because some are smart, some aren't. You have to have the right 
the right genes. I have a certain gene. I'm a gene believer. Do we believe in the gene thing? I mean, I do. I have a great genes and all that stuff, which I'm a believer in. When you connect two racehorses, you usually end up with a fast horse. Secretariat doesn't produce slow horses. Well, I think I was born with a drive for success. I was born with a certain intellect. The fact is, you have to be born and blessed with something up here. God helped me by giving me a certain brain. It's this. It's not my salesmanship. It's what? This. You know what that is? It's the brain power. <laughs> I'm not sure why I got a bigger laugh, the monkeys or the this. Okay, so what is he saying there? I believe in the gene thing, right? I believe in the gene thing. What is the gene thing? We see elements of all of the stories that we've talked about so far. The idea that your genes destine you to a certain outcome, the idea that your genes are your true self, and the final pernicious piece, that the genes make him better than other people. And because he's better than other people, we don't need to worry about inequality. We don't need to worry about the fact that people who are different have less freedom or enjoy less political power. So for many, many years, the antithesis of this eugenic perspective has been to emphasize genetic sameness. Genes can't form a natural hierarchy of humans if there are no genetic differences that matter between us. But now the DNA genie is out of the bottle. We can see that genes make a difference for how people's life outcomes go. So how do we engage in that science and how do we make sense of it without feeding this old, dangerous story, the gene thing, eugenic story? I think in order to do that, we need to articulate an anti-eugenics. And I want to give you an example of anti-eugenic thinking from an American context. So the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law in 1990 by the first George Bush, and it prohibits discrimination against people who have disabilities in places of public accommodation. So it's a piece of civil rights legislation that guarantees equal access to and enjoyment of a kind of a public building or a public service. In the course of my work as a professor, I most commonly encounter ADA regulations, not around physical disabilities, but by students who are hearing impaired. So I teach to many students every semester, and my, um, I usually need an ASL translator and everything captioned so that students who are hearing impaired can participate, have access to and enjoyment to, enjoyment of your mandated intro site class, uh, of that public good that's provided by the University of Texas. That is a really interesting conception of equality there. It's not a law that pretends everyone's the same. In fact, it would be illegal for me to pretend that everyone in my class is the same. I'm legally mandated to see, to, see, to recognize, and to accommodate differences in functioning. Equality is not achieved by pretending everyone is the same. Equality is not achieved by treating everyone exactly the same. If I built a building and I put a staircase in it and no elevator, and I said, you have equal access to the building, look, everyone can go up the staircase, that would be illegal because people who are mobility impaired can't go up the staircase, they need the elevator. There was a, um, a big controversy in New York City some decades ago because Mother Teresa and her order were going to build a, um, a building to serve impoverished men in the city, and they didn't want to spend the money on an elevator. And they said, you know what, we don't need an elevator. The sisters can just carry men who are disabled up and down the stairs. And the New York City said, no, you won't. Like, that's not happening. Because that's treatment based on pity. That's not changing the structure such that people can be accommodated, such that people can participate in a way that reflects their dignity as equals, as humans. I think of the ADA as an anti-eugenic policy. It doesn't matter the differences 
why the differences in people's functionings exist. If my student is hearing impaired by virtue of a congenital genetic disorder, or is hearing impaired by virtue of an accident that's their fault, or is hearing impaired by virtue of an accident that wasn't their fault, that has no bearing on their claim to equity and inclusion in my class. What if we took this anti-eugenic model, not just for physical spaces, not just for making sure there's an ASL translator for intro psych classes, but as a conception of equality more broadly, if our economic and political systems were set up such that it was our responsibility to arrange them, that regardless of the hand you were dealt in the genetic lottery, regardless of the bad or good luck that you experience in your childhood, regardless of the bad things that happened to you over the course of your adulthood, no matter the cause of your differences in psychological functioning, you were given a structure such that you could participate with equal access and enjoyment. That's the thought experiment that I want to leave you with tonight. What is the ADA version of society? Not just with regards to differences in physical functioning, but differences in psychological functioning. This idea is very directly related to one of my other favorite science papers, which is by the evolutionary biologist, the Doshiusta Jabjanski, who wrote an article in 1962 called Genetics and Equality. These are very old ideas, very old questions we're debating here. Jabjanski wrote, genetic diversity is mankind's most precious resource not a regrettable deviation from an ideal state of monotonous sameness. So I'll end there. I look forward to your questions and to chatting you afterwards, and thank you so much for your attention.